I love her though. <laughs> oh, hello everybody. And welcome to Chain Breakers. We are a Christian recovery program that focuses on the road to recovery using the 12 steps, recognizing Jesus as our higher power. We use various recovery materials, including the Bible, AA Big Book, and a basic text, celebrate recovery and other relevant sources. The Chain Breakers experience allows you to be changed, transformed, and renewed by God working in your life. As you work and study the 12 steps and share your experience, strength, and hope with others, you will step into the future that God has planned for each one of you. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the 12 steps, you will experience a cognitive change in your thinking. This is essential because the problem centers in our minds. The result of, a spirit, of the spiritual awakening is sobriety and freedom from addiction. We believe that through the 12 steps and the power of Jesus Christ that we can be chain breakers. If you're not a Christian, please know that you are wanted and welcome here. We will pass the baskets uh, for donations to help pay for weekly expenses, including free literature and Bibles we give to our patients when bringing our meeting into treatment centers for H&I. If you're watching online and would like to donate, we will post the link in the comments section that will take you directly to the church's donation page. Please just select Chain Breakers in the fun section. Every dollar helps and we thank you for your contributions. Whether you can donate or not, we appreciate you being with us. And hello, um, everybody on Facebook who is watching uh, virtually. Welcome. We're happy to have you with us. We encourage sponsorship. A sponsor is someone who will take you through the 12 steps. We also encourage you to get a list of phone numbers to help you build a support network. If anyone would like a list of phone numbers, would you please raise your hand? Go ahead. Can we have one uh, for the guys? If the guys will sign it for Mike. Thank you. Do we have any newcomers or visitors to the group for the first time that would like to introduce themselves? Okay. If you're willing and able to be a sponsor, would you please raise your hands and keep them up for a moment? Thank you for your service. If you need a sponsor, please talk to one of these people after the meeting. We will stop the recording that we do for our online participants to protect the anonymity of the group when we are through with the study for open share. The recording will always only be on the speakers that are comfortable breaking anonymity to protect the group. Chain Breakers is doing our best to reach people who can and cannot make it to meetings throughout this pandemic. Um, okay, so we don't need to go over that. So my name is Angelina and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. And with me tonight, I have uh, my friend Val. Hi. Hi, Val. Val. Um, so, I've asked her to come out and share her story tonight. Um, I've actually never heard it, so I'm really excited. And I've known Val for like two years now, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I look up to her, and she has a strong message of recovery. Um, just when I hear her sharing um, at, at meetings, you know, and um, she's been through some stuff and still has peace and a good attitude and that attitude of gratitude, even going through things. Because, you know, um, just because we decide we're going to get sober, um, that doesn't mean that, you know, life is never going to throw curveballs our way anymore. But it does mean that we have a, uh, a solid foundation that we can go through these storms with peace and um, have an unshakable foundation. And that's what I've seen um, in Vail and uh, from the bits of stories I've heard her share just while sharing at meetings. Um, you know, she always has something uh, that I can take away with me. So... Um, I'm so proud of you, and I'm really excited uh, to hear your story. So uh, with that, I give you Vail. Let's give her a warm welcome. It's funny. I, I, I've spoken at so many meetings, and I've spoken at so many places, um, and I've spoken for H&I, and, I, and it always, I'm always super nervous when I speak. And uh, some of the girls in my house are here, um, uh, and they'll tell you that I can talk all day long about my God, all day long, right? <laughs> they get kind of tired of hearing about my God, but, you know, it's funny because um, he's always there with me. Mm. So my name is Val, mm. definitely a reckless alcoholic. Hi, Val. Um, my sober date is 9-11 of 2019. I have a sponsor, I have a home group, and I have a grand sponsor, and I also have sponsees. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of my experience, strength, and hope. Um, I, you know, grew up in a pretty normally functioning family, so I thought as a child I didn't have any really traumatic things. Um, my father was diagnosed with cancer when I was five years old. Um, he died when I was 10. Um, he was 34 years old. He died of cancer, brain cancer. Um, 
And after that, my mom, you know, started drinking. And to me, you know, drinking was pretty normal in my household. Um, little did I know that I come from a long list of alcoholics. My grandfather is a reckless alcoholic. My mother is still a reckless alcoholic. And uh, I am an alcoholic. Um, pretty much, I went through life pretty normally. I, um, you know, wanted to escape life. And it's funny, I didn't pick up my first drink until I was 40 years old. Wow. I'm currently 50. I had a sip of champagne at my wedding. Alcohol was never a problem. I always thought I was normal. I can drink like a normal person. Um, I have proved that wrong. Um, I started drinking at 40 years old. It started out on a Wednesday night. I would go out with my girlfriends. I'd have a couple drinks Wednesday night. Wednesday nights turned into Friday nights. Friday nights turned into Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. You know, any any day that ended in a Y, I was there. You know, the party, the party was me. The party was one and only at the end, okay? Um, mm. And I can tell you that um, in 10 years, I tore it up. I was a rock star in the streets. Um, I, I, I mean, I loved everything about alcohol. It's so cunning and baffling. It was my first and only love. Mm. Um, I've been married for 30 years. Um, I threw all that away for a, a bottle of vodka. It, it's crazy that you would throw out. It's funny because people used to tell me, nobody can keep you sober, and that's the truth. Mm. Um, I have two amazing children. Um, I have a husband. And the truth is, is that alcohol actually totally took over my whole life. Um, I used to, you know, cunning and baffling, I used to say, I can't be an alcoholic. You know, I, I didn't even pick up the first drink till I was 40. Who can say that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I can. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, that's the way it went. It went downhill pretty quickly. Um, I started out just having fun. Um, you know, probably for two or three years, it was fun, you know, and, uh, and I fell in love with it. You know, as soon as I could get out of myself, um, I just loved it. I loved the party scene. I liked, you know, I just liked the people. I liked everything about it. Um, I was tired of being like the mom and the wife and the white picket fence. I, and it was funny. It was kind of like I relived my teenage years in my mm. 40s. Um, and then it got to the point where my family couldn't save me. So I, you know, I left my family for alcohol. Um, I left them behind because um, alcohol was more important to me than my family. And uh, that's the saddest part of my story. It makes me cry um, that I could be somebody that would do that to their own family. Um, but, you know, it, it just happened for me that way. Um, so I left my family and I went down to South Philly, 7th and Jackson. If you all know 7th and Jackson, that's where I live, 7th and Jackson. Um, and... Uh, you know, I was a low bottom drunk at that time. You know, I still went to work every day. I still functioned at work. I was never fired from a job. So it's funny. I used to look at the girls on the street buying off the 7th of Jackson and think, not that bad yet. Mm. Um, and then it got to the point where these girls started becoming my friends, you know? And um, at night I would get home from work and I used my septa pass and I put these girls on the 47 bus. And if you've ever been to 7th of Jackson, the 47 bus takes you out of the city. And uh, I, became friends with these girls and I used to put them on this bus. And um, it finally got so bad, my blackouts were so bad, I could never remember the night before. I would wake up with Pat's cheesesteak all over my floor, never knew how I got the Pat's, <laughs> never knew how I got the cheesesteak, never knew how I got in the house. Uh, the drug dealers used to basically, they used to be like, hey Blondie, you're, we know where you live, you're walking the wrong way, honey. And they used to point me in the right direction. Um, it was just, it was such a hideous life. I can't even tell you. I was so sick. Um, and then maybe around August of 2019, I got really sick and I needed an operation. And uh, when I had the operation, I actually died on the table from alcoholism. Um, I had an internal abscess. Um, it, was, it was pretty bad. But, you know, I had tubes sticking out all over me in um, two weeks. For my follow-up visit, I went back to the doctors and the doctor said to me, you know what, Mrs. Sober, why don't you just uh, go home and make your arrangements because I can smell the vodka on your breath mm. and uh, you'll be dead by Christmas. And, um, you know, me and my ego, I went out to my car, Walnut Street, parking garage and said, you're the biggest asshole I ever met. Yeah. <laughs> I, said, I was like, you're the biggest asshole. Do you know who I am? I have a good insurance, you know, you can save me, right? And um, I was mad that he had the nerve to tell me that, you know what I mean? And that he couldn't save me, you know? But little did I know, I didn't know how to save myself. Mm. Um, so 
you know, I took some suggestion. My son is 29 years old. He works at the Bucks County Juvenile Prison. He is a teacher, um, an alcohol and drug counselor now, and a sexual abuse counselor. And uh, I remember him calling me and he was like, Mom, like, you need to do something for yourself. Like, you're, you're really, you're falling far off the mark now. And, and, you know, this is going to kill you. And, um, you know, we really want you around. So I took, that was my first suggestion I ever took, right? My first suggestion was, is I'm gonna go ahead and check myself into rehab. Um, little did I know how much God will work in my life. This is, this, is, this is how my God story goes, right? So I went to rehab, and I'm in rehab about four days. I'm sick, I'm, I, I'm refusing everything, because you know me, I'm tough. I'm like, you know, I don't want, I don't want none of your drugs. Like, I'm already <laughs> addicted, I don't, I don't want anything more. Don't help me, I wanna feel, I wanna know what this feels mm. like, right? And um, I'm, I'm sitting there at uh, this rehab up in the Poconos, like probably like 300 miles away from South Philly, right? And this little girl staring at me for two days, and I'm like a raven lunatic. I'm like, if she keeps on staring at me, I'm just gonna have to beat her up. Like, I can't do this anymore, right? <laughs> and um, this little girl comes up to me after two days, and she said, hey, you don't remember me, but you put me on the 47 bus. Oh, stop. And uh, you took me out of the city, and I called my grandma, and she ends up at the same rehab at me, 300 miles away. Wow. Here, she was like, you don't have a problem. Never saw you buy off the corner, right? But that was my first, wow. that was my first God experience, right? This is how God was trying to save me. You know, you can help others mm. if you help yourself. Mm. And um, just a little tidbit, this girl still lives in a sober home in South Philly and is still sober to this day. Oh, wow. That's yeah. awesome. So um, that's how God started working in my life. So I went to the rehab and, you know, after 30 days I thought, oh, I'm going to get out of this rehab. My family's going to love me again, right? We always think, like, we're fixed, right? right. Everything's great now, right? And I got out of rehab and I found out that my husband didn't love me as much as I thought. My kids couldn't trust me, you know? Mm -hmm. My family really didn't want to speak to me. And um, I had pretty much wrecked everything like a Tasmanian devil and mm. there was no way I was gonna get that back. Mm. Um, so my son made a suggestion and I go live in sober living. And I was like, this is my second I'm not taking your suggestion thing. I'm like, go to sober living, who are you kidding? I'm, I'm 40 years old, I'm not going you know, to sober living. Excuse me, I was 48 at the time. I'm not going to sober living, I don't need sober living. And my son said to me, you know mom, people that um, stay sober get time under their belt. They do stuff that's uncomfortable, mm. you know? Mm. So you're gonna have to do the uncomfortable if you ever wanna talk to us again. Mm. And for me, that was like, wow, you know, I, I need this. I need this more than I know. Um, so I, I took the suggestion and I went to sober living and um, You know, I I went I went to the st. Charles meeting if you guys ever know that meeting I went there on a Friday night and I remember looking around the room and I thought all oh, these people You know, they they have so much like peace of mind, right? Like here. I'm sitting there I'm like, I don't I don't want your boat had one of those. I don't want your house had one of those You know, I don't want your things. What I want is your peace of mind. I didn't have peace of mind I couldn't live with myself you know, I, I'm so uncomfortable with me all the time. And I'm sure you hear that a lot. Like, my problem is, is that without alcohol, I didn't know how just to be me. Mm. Um, and that was huge for me. Um, so I went to Sober Living and um, I got a sponsor and I got a home group and I worked these steps. Um, and I didn't chintz on the steps. You know, I didn't do one mm. in 12, right? I worked right. them all the way through right. to the best of my ability because action put me where I am today. Mm -hmm. And I would re recommend that to anybody. Um, so as, you know, as Angelina was saying that, you know, then it was funny, I got sober and I felt great, right? And I'm like, well, I can do this, you know, this is awesome. And then um, I never went to the doctors, obviously, after my thing. And I went to the doctors and last October I was diagnosed with cancer. Wow. And, um, you know, all I can say is it's like, you know, God is like my oxygen, right? I can't see him, but I know I need him, right? Mm. And the reason I say that is just because when I was diagnosed with cancer, I was like, I, I've done all this stuff and now you're going to give me cancer. Like, really? Like, you know, am I not doing the next right thing? I started having doubts. Mm. Um, and, you know, the bottom line is, is that God has been so good to me this whole entire journey. And I never really believed in a God before this. Like, I believed in a God that my parents, you know, 
try to take me to church. They try to tell me if I sin, I'm going straight to hell and all these things. You know, <laughs> my God wasn't forgiving, right? That my God could never forgive me for all the things I've done. Um, and I remember when I was diagnosed, I went home and one of the girls in my house was there and I remember telling them like, wow, you know, now I have cancer, now I need surgery. Like, I don't know what's gonna happen to me, you know? And, um, and for a little bit, I thought, I don't know how I'm gonna do this and stay sober, right? Because my first escape is to go pick up a drink somewhere. Right. You know what I mean? Because, you know, and, and I remember I just, you know, I truly get down on my knees and I pray. I always, I've always thought that if I let go and let God, good things happen to me, right? And this whole entire journey, I can tell you that I truly let go and I let God. And um, so I was diagnosed with cancer. I went ahead and I had the surgery, right? And then um, right after I had the surgery, I was really sick for about 30 days and I didn't understand why I was sick. And then I found out during the surgery, the doctor cut my utero from my kidney to my bladder. So I was dying from the inside out, an internal abscess in my stomach for 32 days. Um, and I remember I was telling Angelina the story. I was lying in the hospital and I remember saying to God, I was in so much pain. And I said, you know, either you can take me because now I don't live with fear, right? I have no fear and I have no worry. And the reason I don't have fear and worry about anything is because I truly let go and let God. Mm. You know, when I'm going through something, I just say, you know what, Lord, I can't handle this right now. Mm. I'm in the Special Olympics. I can't jump any more of your hurdles. Either you have to take it away because I can't do this right now. Mm. And every time, every time, and the girls laugh at me because I always say to them, I'm gonna pray on it for you. And mm. one of my girls is here, lives in my house. Every time I pray on something, God gives it to me, mm. you know? And it's funny, when I pray for things and I don't get them, it's truly for my protection. When I pray yeah. for them, it's truly for his direction. Yeah. And that is the so true for me. Mm. Um, and I remember lying there and I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't live in fear anymore, right? If you need to take me tomorrow, I'm at peace with myself right now. Mm -hmm. And you can take me. But if you're gonna wake me up tomorrow, then you need to give me a purpose. Mm -hmm. Don't you know he woke me up the next day? He woke me up the next day and he continues to wake me up, right? And I'm not 100% cured yet. You know, I still have a lot to go through, but I sit here in front of you like a miracle, right? When, when I go to the doctor, he laughs at me. He's like, can you Google me five stars? Because you're like a walking miracle. That's what he says to me all the time, right? <laughs> because I literally was so sick, I could barely get out of bed. I would have to call the girls from my house like, can you take me to the bathroom? I wore, I wore a, a mm. pee bag for three months straight. You know, when I was lying in the hospital, they're like, you're going to have to wear this pee bag for the rest of your life. I mean, I broke down in tears and I was saying to God, how much more can you put me through, God? Like, what are you doing to me right now, right? but I've never doubted that he was there by my side the whole entire time. Um, and, um, you know, pretty much, I mean, it, it's just, it's crazy how, you know, when you get sober and you truly want it, that with a little, it's funny, it's a little bit of action and a whole lot of faith Amen. for me, you yeah. know? And I just, I sit back and I let him do the work. I don't even have to really do the work anymore, right? I wake up every day and I ask him to keep me sober. I ask him for direction and, um, and he gives it to me every time. And a lot of you that, you know, are sitting there newly in sobriety and you're, you know, you're still trying to control everything. Cause I'm a huge controller, right? I'll control everything. I'll, I'll control the way somebody does their hair or somebody flushes the toilet, <laughs> how you're blowing your nose. You know what I mean? Um, you know, but when I stopped giving up my own control and I started letting him make my own destination, things just started falling into place for me, you know? I no longer have the desire to drink. I can pass a liquor store where, you know, where I couldn't wait for the liquor store to open. I was camping outside in liquor stores. <laughs> South Philly, I knew every liquor store. I'd go to the Acme at 10 a.m. I'd be at the one at Columbia Avenue at 11.30. Like, you know, um... It's funny how my obsession has been totally led to drink, mm. you know? And when life gets lifey, I know how to deal with it now. Mm. That's the greatest gift I've been given by working this program, is that no matter what comes at me, I still can deal with life. Right mm. after I um, had the kidney surgery, I was, my car was hitting a hit and run, and the guy ran away, right? This is like, now it's three times. I'm like, nothing else more can happen, right? And then, you know, I just pray on a lot of things. My daughter got kicked out of, um, 
my mother-in-law's house, um, you know, in my husband's house, they kicked her out of the house. And in 24 hours, I was praying to God, I can't do this. Now, thinking about, I managed the sober house now that I live in. Now I have to leave all the girls and I'm feeling guilty. And I'm like, oh God, you know, here I am taking care of 11 women on a daily basis. And I can't even take care of my own 20 year old child, right? Mm. I felt this enormous guilt. I'm ready to pick up and like pack my bags and move back to, you know, Philadelphia and take care of my own. And I remember praying to God, I'm like, God, let this work out. And once again, he creates another miracle in my life, right? My daughter goes look at this apartment, she brings her, she brings her mother's boyfriend with her. And I prayed on it the night before, like, God, just take care of her, whatever it takes. You know, her her boyfriend's mom gets out of the car. Here he's, she's known the landlord for 20 years. He immediately mm. rents to her. Wow. Once again, God takes away my worry and my fear, right? I give it up to him, and he makes sure that it all works out for me, you know? Um, and unfortunately, you know, life isn't, life isn't great, right? I mean, as you hear by my story, you know, there's a lot of challenges in life. But now I have the tools in my toolbox and the mm, foundation yeah. to deal with life as it comes at me, you know? I don't cry over, you know, my hair is not good today, you know, my, my eyelashes, like whatever it is. They're all the simple things, you know what I mean? And when big things happen to me, I now know how to deal with them, you know what I mean? And um, life is a struggle. And it's, you know, and it's funny, it's a struggle to stay sober. But when you stay in tune with yourself and your inner self and your network and, you know, you, like I'm the one thing I'm blessed with is a great network of women. I have the best mm. women. I mean, it's funny that the women call me and I'm always like, you want to hear my God story for today? They laugh at me all the time because I'm constantly out there. I should be like an evangelist or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> but the true testament is, is that, you know, he takes care of me. Right. And I have no idea why. Right. Mm. I always like, I'm not deserving. I'm not deserving mm. of this. I'm not deserving of this kind of love, I'm not deserving of this kind of sobriety because I am that horrible person. Right. And the truth is, is that I am deserving now today. I am deserving. Right. And today not living in constant in my head. I don't live in my head anymore. And that's the greatest, one of the greatest mm. gifts. I don't live in my head anymore. When things happen to me, I pray on them. I'm like, all right. See you later. Now I'm going to go eat some ice cream. You know, I redirect, right? But because I'm willing to give this up to my higher power, I'm willing to believe that my higher power is going to work for me. And um, the, the truth is, is that it works for me. And if it doesn't, you know, if it, if it doesn't work for everybody, I mean, because it's funny. I want to save everybody. I want to save you, you, you. I want, I, I want you all. I, I want everybody to be saved, right, in sobriety. Because this is the greatest gift I've ever had, you know? I'm living in a sober house. I don't have a lot of things, right? But things mean nothing. And it's funny, my favorite um, saying is Proverbs 31, 25. She's clothed in strength and dignity mm. and laughs without fear of the future. Mm. And that is my favorite saying of all times. And um, my daughter had that saying tattooed um, on her shoulder for me. Mm. And then my grandmother dies. And we're sitting there at the funeral, and the pastor stands up. Nobody knows she has a tattoo, and he says, Amelia was clothed in strength and yeah. dignity and laughed without fear of the future. That was like my grandmother coming right down, like God's just putting her right there again. Yeah. There, there's my God right there, just, you know, standing out, telling me everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about it anymore. Mm -hmm. I got your back. And that's what happens to me. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got my back. Mm -hmm. Um... So, I mean, I don't really, I don't know. I mean, it's so, it's so hard for me to speak to all of you, but I just wanted to let you know that, you know, no matter what you go through, there's a way out for yeah. all of us. Yeah. There is a way out. And the way out is through the action of working a program and getting in tune with whatever your higher power is. It could be a blade of grass for all I care. It could be a star for all I care. Yeah, like, right. It doesn't don't have even. to be. Yeah, it could be anything you want it to be. But in the end, like my higher power is Jesus Christ. And the reason it's Jesus Christ is because through Jesus Christ, I get to God, mm. right? And like yes. I said, I can't see God, mm. right? Mm -hmm. But he's like oxygen. Because like I woke up today and I woke up breathing, right? That's a gift every one of us in this room have. Mm. Because I see girls at my house go out and never come home. Mm. And it's heartbreaking to see that, you know? 
And, um, and it, no matter how much I pray sometimes, and I kind of realize that I can't save anybody, everybody in this room, but I can at least put the message out there that what works for me. And when I put my message out there, um, you know, people tend to respond. It's funny, when I first started, you know, I was always talking about my God, you know, my daughter's like, Mom, really? Like, people are gonna run away from you, right? Mm -hmm. But it's funny, I speak at meetings now, and women come up to me and they were like, wow, you've been through all that and you stay sober, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I broke a nail yesterday and I went to the bar and had a drink. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, just, just keep the plug in the jug and just, you know, reach out to your own innermost self. You know what I mean? And if you don't have a higher power to pray to yet, just pray to whatever you feel that you need to pray to to stay sober. Because I'm telling you, I'm a true testament that it works. And I can live life on life's terms. And I don't live in fear. And I live with no worry. And uh, that is the greatest gift I have, is I have peace. Mm. And if I walk out of this room and get hit by a bus, I'm okay with that. Because no longer am I going third fire from the left. And if y'all have s'mores, I don't want any. So thank you for letting thank me share my story. Thank you. I love that. And I love when you said, um, you know, he makes a way, right? And that's because Jesus, he is the way maker. Um, and, you know, the verse that came to mind is John uh, 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father but through me. And, um, you know, I had some of that old idea stuff too. Like, you know, I was condemned to hell, you know, I was raised, um, in a particular re religion and, you know, I'm not even saying that's what that religion, uh, is saying. That was my perception of it. Um, you know, I thought that, you know, I was getting condemned every time I turned around. If I didn't go to confession, no, now I'm not right. Now I got to do all these Hail Marys and all this stuff. And I'm praying to, to, to Mary and to all this stuff. And I always felt like um, you can, like, I always felt like I would pray. But, like, my prayers hit the ceiling. And I couldn't feel God, right? And when God brought me to that verse, right, that it was only through him do we get to the Father? And I didn't understand why that was. And, um, you know, and everyone's at different parts in, in, in their walk. For me, um, you know, I believe the Bible is the, is the final word. And when I started to read this, that's when I started to feel God. And what I didn't understand was the reason that Jesus came was because the truth is, like you said, I didn't deserve it. The truth is none of us deserved it. Because just like scripture tells us, all fall short of the glory of God. And that's why, see, and there's, it, God is holy, right? God is holy and we are not. That's just the fact of the matter, right? And so God was never sending us to hell. I was already going to hell because even based, I'm not even saying based on like a standard of, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments or something like that. Based on my own standards that I set for myself, I fall short of that and can't even keep up to my own standards. So I was constantly falling short, right? And like I said, God, he's holy. And so we can't come to him in our sin because he can't look upon it um, because he is a holy God, right? So we were, I was already going to hell because of my sin. And so what God did was that he sent me a way out. He sent me a life vest right? Like that boat, it's going down. I was already going down because of my sin and all the bad things that I had done and all the people that I had hurt. Threw out the preserver. Yes. And he threw out the preserver and that was Jesus Christ, right? And that is exactly why he sent his son to die on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven, so that your sins could be forgiven. And every single person in this room, why? Because God wants to have a relationship with me. And I get to have that relationship through his son, Jesus Christ. And what I realized that my prayers were blocked, you know, and I always say this, and I know, you know, people, they have what they want. Um, but, you know, and I always say this, because this is what I was told, you know, the first time I went through the steps, I'm not a first time winner. I, um, you know, relapsed many times. And like the first person said, oh, step two, it can be whatever you want, right? Well, God calls that idolatry. 
And, um, you know, this is the way I like to look at it. Someone said, write down everything you want God to be. And then that can be your God, and you can pray to that. Okay? And then God gave me a revelation about that. If, you know, if you walked in the room, Ryan, okay, and I just met you for the first time, and I said, hold up, hold up. I'm going to write down everything that I think you should be. Okay? And now I want you to come and conform to what I think you should be. Would you do that? Absolutely not. But yet people think a holy God Steve, he's such a prankster back there. <laughs> but here's the thing. People wouldn't do that. But then they expect that a holy, all-powerful God would come and conform to what I think he should be for my comfortability. He would not be God. Then he would not be God. Right? Yep. That would make me God. Exactly. Because I'm saying what God should be. God tells us exactly who he is. And he sent us his son to die so that we could be forgiven and that we could all have an intimate relationship with you. God wants to have an intimate relationship with you. And it was when I saw these things, right? And that, that's like my verse. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And God showed me that way, right? In having a personal relationship with Jesus, he totally came into my life and I had a powerful encounter with him. And I have never been the same. I needed to have a profound spiritual awakening to remove that obsession to drink and use drugs because it had me caught in bondage and I was chained to it. And the drugs said jump and I said how high. And it didn't matter my kids that I hurt. It didn't matter my husband who I hurt. It said do it and I said how high. And it wasn't until I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ that he showed me the way. And when I saw that verse, right, and I was saying these things, the doorknob, these crazy things we think, and then we think God's going to conform to our image and that we can pray and we're going to be heard. And then we wonder why so many people feel like they can't access the power of God, right? And I, uh, I have to tell you what the truth is. And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. And he is the way. And God sent us that way out through his son, Jesus. Right? The Bible says that the only way that we can atone for sin is by blood. So people in the Old Testament, before Jesus came, had to go to the altar every time. They had to slay an animal for the blood and do all these rituals so that they can be forgiven. Right? We don't have to do any of that anymore because it's Jesus' blood. Once and for all that we're forgiven. Our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins. We are forgiven. He loves us. He has a good plan for our life. My favorite verse, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a good future. That's what God wants for your life. We have to accept it. And it's just like I was saying, so like I was already going to, to hell because of all the things I had done. I was all, God didn't send me there. I sent myself I there by yeah. what I was doing. What God did was he threw me that life jacket, right? It's like if the Titanic is going down. If I don't get on that lifeboat, I'm going to drown, and I'm going down, right? So God threw us that lifeboat in the form of his son to say, but here's the thing. If I don't receive that life vest, I'm going to die, mm -hmm. right? And so when I saw that and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, listen, for you that, that don't know me, I was a hopeless alcoholic and addict. I could not stop. No matter what I did, I could not stop. I wanted to stop. I would make promises to stop. I was the queen of broken promises to myself and to everyone around me. And I was like a tornado going through people's lives, taking all my loved ones captive with me. And then I would wreck my life once again and say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, I'll never do it again. And I really meant it in the morning. I am really was sorry and I really thought I was going to not do it again but sometimes it would be a few hours later and there I was doing it again saying how did this happen lack of power that was my dilemma right I didn't have the power to stop on my own right and Romans uh, 7 I, I wanted to read something else but you know God said we got a little bit of time so as I always say I'm up here you're not so you're gonna hear it <laughs> All right, so Romans chapter 7, and this is, let me find Romans, where is it? 
Here we go. So Romans chapter 7. This is step one to a T. See, my willpower availed me nothing. Because if willpower was enough for me, the million times I got out of rehab and said, I'm really not going to do it again, and then did it again anyway. If my willpower availed, I wouldn't have done it again. I'd lost the power to choose whether I was going to do it again or not. Because in the morning, I would say, that's it. I'm making a choice. I'm done. Right? But there I was doing it again. My willpower didn't work. This wasn't about my willpower. Right? It was about God's power. That restored me. And I love this. Romans chapter 7, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it is step one to a T. It starts out here and says, uh, let's see. <laughs> I'm not going to start. I know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. If you look up the definition of a slave, a slave is someone who endures no choice. I was a slave to addiction. Okay? I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. I want to stay sober. I want to stop hurting everybody. But that good I want to do, I don't do it. So I don't understand it. And I think I'm this terrible person. And what I don't understand is that really I'm a sick person, right? Uh, and then it goes on to say here, uh, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I do, I hate. And I hated what I was doing and I couldn't stop. Okay? And, and if you don't know, all of these steps, they were written from the Bible, predominantly from the book of James. So, uh, you know, whether you do NA, AA, you know, they got these 12 steps, NA and the other fellowships from the original fellowship um, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, Bill Wilson and the co-founder and Dr. Bob, they were Christians. And uh, they wrote this, the Bible, you see there's correlating scriptures from the Bible, predominantly from the book of James. And they were, they originally called themselves the James Club. The James Club, yeah. Yes. So um, this is where it all came from. So it's not that there's the 12 steps and then I can correlate it from here. No, it was here first. So God is telling us right here exactly what addiction is and what happens. Okay? So it says, um, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. But it is the sin living in me, right? It's the addiction living in us that's driving our lives, okay? For I know that good itself is not dwelling in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. I have the desire to stay sober, right? But I cannot carry it out. That's step one. My willpower availed me nothing. I had lost the power to choose whether I was going to do it again or not. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do this I keep on doing. Tell me this is not addiction. Mm -hmm. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me, right? And addiction is absolutely from the devil. Amen. There is a God, right? And there is an enemy. Just because you don't want to accept that God the devil doesn't care. He doesn't want you to believe in God because he's got you in the grip. Okay? Um, I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. And where does the disease center? center my in mind. my mind. Okay? Making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. And I don't know about you, but I was a prisoner to drugs and alcohol. Okay? Here we go. I lost my spot. What a wretched man I am. You guys ever wake up after doing something terrible the night before and you wake up and you feel like that? What a wretched man I am, right? I said probably a lot worse things about myself, right? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Because that's what we are in addiction. We're subject to death. Just like the doctor said to you. I mean, I died. I mean, I there you literally go. died. And then as soon as I felt well enough, I went right back out and picked up a drink. Right. That's the insanity. Yes. That's the total insanity. Because you had no choice. I had no choice. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And that's what I heard, too. There's so much misinformation going around in the rooms. Oh, well, you, she just chose to drink again. No, when you really understand this disease and you read that big book, it tells me over and over again that I've lost the power to choose. Yeah. That's why it's so important to We're have powerless. a good sponsor. We're powerless. <laughs> that's what powerless means. Mm -hmm. A powerless, powerless, same thing as slim. Yeah. sin, or um, a slave, someone who has no choice. No choice. Okay? 
So, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, who will save me from this body? Jesus Christ our Lord will. He did it for me and he'll do it for you. Okay? He doesn't care who you are, what you've done. He already knows what you've done. Scripture told me, and then I thought I was condemned, and when I started reading the Word of God, I'm like, wait, God, God don't say that, what they were telling me, you. He right? He loves you unconditionally. Yes. Unconditionally. Yes. That's the, that's the, that's the greatest gift, Yes, right? he's not condemning me. Mm -hmm. He says, look, all fall short of the glory of God. Everybody. Guess what? If I could be good of my own self, nobody could, not one person. Yeah. We're not even talking addiction. No, no human can do it. We all will fall short. Even according to our own standard, we will fall short. Right? God already knew that. That's why he sent Jesus to die for your sins. So that you could be forgiven. Not so you could have a religion. So that you could have a personal relationship with him. That's what he wants and desires for each and every single one of you. Right? Because guess what? If I could earn it and I could be good on my own, Jesus would have never had to die. It's true. Right? If I could earn it on my own. We, I wouldn't need Jesus. And I Everybody think falls short. When you have an open mind as well. Mm -hmm. When, Like for me, I had a very closed mind, right? Until like this girl came up to me in rehab and was like, yo, you put me on the 47 bus, right? You know, mm -hmm. for me, it opened my mind that God was always trying to speak to me. Always, I just wasn't yeah. listening. Mm. You know, I didn't care what he had to say to me, right? Yeah. I was going to I was gonna live life on Val's terms. Why am I <laughs> right. living life on your terms? Right, right. My way is much better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and the truth is, is that when I start opening my eyes, mm -hmm. and I, I like Ange, and Ange will tell you, I'll be like, "Do you want to hear?" You know, I have I all, I have all so these many good spiritual God stories experiences, yeah. right? Because everything is not just the common denominator. Things just mm -hmm. don't happen out of coincidence in my life. They truly happen because God is letting them happen. Mm -hmm. God is saying, "You know what, Val? I'm going to get you through this." He you is going to. And when I, yeah. like I said, when I was laying in the mm -hmm. hospital bed, and I was like, "Either you can take me because I'm ready to go, or you're going to keep me here mm -hmm. to work my 12 step, right? Mm -hmm. To have me here for other people. Do you know what I mean? To show them that you can get through this, no matter what life throws mm -hmm. at you, right? Yeah. That you can do this. And then, like I said, He kept on waking me up. You know what I mean? And he kept on waking me up. And every day made me a little bit stronger, right? Yeah. And here I am today. Last March, I had full-blown kidney surgery. Bladder, both my kidneys were moved to the... Oh, totally repositioned in the front of my body mm -hmm. in March. Mm -hmm. And here I am in front of you today. Do I look sick? Yeah. Do I look sick? Yeah. I don't look sick. Because Jesus Christ has touched my life. And that is mm -hmm. that he has saved my life. Saved my life to be here today, Right? Because he has a greater plan for me, for you, for mm -hmm. you. He has a greater plan for all of us. Mm -hmm. We just have to be open-minded and accept yes. that there's another plan out there for and every one of us. And we have to accept the plan. That's the mm -hmm. thing. It's up to us to receive yep. it. Here's the thing. You can come in with like a cute little Christmas gift and say, Andrew, I got you this gift. Because that's what God says it is. Salvation is a free gift. Mm -hmm. You can't earn it. It's a gift. You can come in and say, I got this cute little present right here. And give it to me, but if I don't receive it, that gift's never going to be mine. It's up to us to receive it. So, um, and I love, you know, and he does save us, you know. And I was saying, that people don't know my story. You know, I was on the television show, Intervention. Um, it's the bottom of the barrel, okay? You don't get on that unless you're at the bottom of the barrel. I was at the bottom of the barrel. And you want evidence of God? Watch that show. Because there's no resemblance of that person that lives in me yeah. today. I got people laughing at me. Yeah. That's okay. I accept that, though, because that's how good God is, right? And this wasn't that, you know, the nine-step promises, we, you know, we will know peace, right? Not I will wish for peace, but I will know it. I will know that I have had an encounter with God. When I have my morning time with God, I can literally physically feel his presence on my life. I get goosebumps all over, and half the time I'm in tears, not sad tears, because I am overwhelmed with joy. Even going through things, even going through things, because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So when I accept him into my heart, he comes and he lives inside of me. So now I get access to all that he is. So I didn't have peace before, but guess what? The Prince of Peace lives in me now, so now I have peace. And that's all I was ever looking for through drugs and alcohol. I was trying to quiet my mind because I had anxiety. Okay? 
Now I have true tangible peace. So I don't desire drugs and alcohol anymore because I have a different solution. A solution um, in God who wants to prosper me and not harm me. So this is, now that I've gone on and on, this was, I went totally off. I had a whole different thing picked out for tonight, but we're still okay. This is what I wanted to really read tonight. And it talked about being a slave and a prisoner there. So uh, this is uh, found in the books, book of Acts, chapter 16. And so this is when the Apostle Paul and Silas, they're put in prison. I'm going to give you a little backstory so you can um, understand what's going on. There was a, uh, a, a girl that was filled with a demon. Um, and basically... The, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Well, we got it. It's two paragraphs. Okay, so this will tell you the backstory of what's going on. So it says, uh, Once we were going to the place of prayer, we met by a female slave who had a spirit, right? That's a demon, by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling, right? And, the, the, you know, we know very well by the Bible that uh, fortune telling, psychics, all of that, um, they, they, they are able to do that through demons. It's, it's a demonic, okay? So, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Why? Because demons will keep you away from that. And the thing is, they're very real. They don't want you to believe in them, okay? Because um, they want you to stay sick and in the darkness. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. That's what happens to us. Because if you don't think addiction is demonic, read about what demonic possession looks like, right? There was the guy at the tomb who was cutting himself and harming himself, right? That was filled with seven demons. If you read it, you would think you were reading the story of addiction. You wouldn't even realize it was about demonic possession, right? And it's the name Jesus Christ, then immediately it left. No other name. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When our owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. I'm almost done here. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks and put them in shackles, okay? You ever feel like you're in shackles with addiction? Bound with chains, right? Let's see what Paul does. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. They were worshiping and praying to God, okay? And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake and that foundation that the prison was whole, shaken and at once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. See, Paul and Silas, they knew that their God was bigger than the problem. And I'm here to tell you tonight that God is bigger than your addiction. Okay? They weren't focused on the problem. They knew it was bigger, so they were focused on God, and they surrendered it to God. And what happened? At once, the chains came off. That was my experience. When I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, at once, the chains came off. I, from the moment I came out of rehab and I gave my life to Christ, I have not had the obsession to drink or use drugs again. I don't struggle with it. My husband drinks. There's alcohol in my fridge, and I was an alcoholic. Okay, it's like it's not even there for me because God has completely removed it, right? The jailer woke up, and when he saw the pr prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and uh, fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then... Uh, he brought them out and asked, Sir, what must I do to be saved? What did Val say? I was saved. What did Jesus come to do? To save you and break the chains. They replied, All you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in the house. And that night, the jailer took them and he washed their wounds. Immediately, he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. That's what we get, totally filled with joy when we come to believe. What do I need to do? Just believe in my heart. That's all I need to do. And I can be saved. And I can have a personal relationship with God. And that encounter can break those chains off of your life. So we never like uh, to close out the night without giving you the opportunity to do that. Um, and I feel it a stirring in my spirit that um, somebody is wanting to do that tonight. And we never like to wrap up the night without giving you that opportunity. And that's what we do in our third step, to surrender our will and our lives over to the pair care of Jesus Christ. He is the one that will break the chains and fill you with joy. And when you're filled with joy, you won't want those drugs and alcohol anymore. So here at Chain Breakers, we know the way to salvation. It's as easy as ABC. A, we just admit, admit the truth about ourselves, that we're sinners and we've made mistakes. We've all made mistakes. B, we believe that God did something about our sin, about our mistakes through his son Jesus when he died on that cross so that we could be forgiven. C, we commit our will and our lives over to his care and protection. And I like to add the D in there. We do it today because tomorrow is never promised. So if you would like to do that, I'm just going to, and if you're watching online, this is for you too. Um, I'm just going to ask everybody in the house to just close your eyes. And um, I just feel a stirring of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for your presence in this place, Lord. And if you would like to do that, and you would like to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, I'm going to ask you to just say this prayer with me. This is all you have to do. Believe, just like we read tonight. You don't have to say it out loud. Just say it from your heart. Something like this. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. I admit that I am a sinner, Lord, and that I've made mistakes. I believe that you did something about my sin, about my mistakes, through your son Jesus when he died on that cross so that I could be forgiven. Jesus, come into my heart. I give you my life and I make you my personal Lord and Savior. With your eyes still closed and your head still bowed, if you said that prayer with me tonight for the first time, would you please raise your hand? I will not call you out. I will not embarrass you. I just want to be able to pray for you. I see that hand right there, and I see that hand right there, and I, I see that hand there also. Just keep them up one moment. I want to be able to pray for you here in a minute, and I want to be able to give you a Bible also. Um, and I just feel, I just keep your eyes closed because I'm just feeling a stirring of the Holy Spirit that there is still somebody in here tonight and that God is calling your name. Receive the life jacket. Receive the life jacket. All you have to do is believe. And I'm just going to give another moment if there's somebody in here tonight who would like to do that. Would you please raise your hand? Okay. Thank you so much, guys. You can open your eyes. Um, if you are watching online and you made that decision, um, please send us a, a personal message so we can congratulate you and we can be praying for you and welcome you into the kingdom of God. So um, we are going to shut off the feed now so we can open the uh, meeting for share. Let's give uh, one more round of applause. You can turn that off. To Val. Amazing. That is so 